Well, we are concluding our series on the Beatitudes. And so let's go ahead and turn to uh, Matthew 5, where we've been for the last several weeks. And we will recap these building blocks to a complete conversion. And then today we are going to see what happens when the conversion is complete. So Jesus began in verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know they need a savior for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And now that the conversion is complete, in verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, <clears throat> blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's very important that we notice that Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are you when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. There's no blessing when people say bad things about us and it's true. There's no blessing when we're being persecuted and we brought the persecution on ourselves. In the 80s, I was in a uh, small study group and one of the members of my small study group had his own painting business and he, he hired a young man to work for him. And this young man had just become a Christian. And... In the course of time, he started getting all kinds of calls at work because he wasn't paying any of his bills. And finally, one time he gets a call from another creditor asking for payment because he wasn't paying any of his bills. He hangs up the phone and he tells my friend, ever since I became a Christian, this persecution has just been happening all the time. but he wasn't being persecuted for being a Christian. He was being persecuted because he wasn't paying any of his bills. We need to be very careful. When we're being persecuted, first, is there a reason? Am I bringing this on myself? Because I know personally, sometimes when people react in a negative manner to me or, or say something back to me that, that I think is offensive, sometimes I'm the one who provoked it. Sometimes I'm the one who brought it on. Back in the 60s, a uh, pitcher for the uh, Giants I think he was the, I know the Giants and Dodgers were involved. Not sure who the batter was, who the pitcher was. But the, uh, the catcher wanted the pitcher to throw the ball at the batter. And the pitcher said, I'm not going to do it. And the catcher said, fine, when I get the ball, I'm going to throw it at him and hit him. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. Well, then 
The batter takes the bat and hits the catcher with the bat. And uh, do you remember who that was, Wally? Okay, was he a giant or a dodger? He was a dodger, right. Right. Okay, it was the Dodgers. The batter was a giant. Right, okay. Well, this was, uh, a, of course, it causes a big, huge fight. It's the only time in Major League Baseball history that somebody actually hit somebody with a bat, which is a big no-no, in case you need to be told that. That's a big no-no. You just don't do that. Well, this catcher did. And he, he hits the, uh, I mean, he gets, the catcher didn't do it. The catcher threw the ball at the batter. The batter hits the catcher with the bat. And so it was a, a big famous story is to this day. Well, after that, the catcher who got hit by a bat and the guy who hit him became friends, and later, I believe, they actually became teammates. I believe, for a while. And after he was retired, after the catcher was retired, somebody asked him, why are you friends with that guy? He hit you with a bat. And the catcher's reply was, yeah, but I brought it on. I started it. And so, you know, that's last week we were talking about being peacemakers. Sometimes being a peacemaker means realizing when you were the one who brought it on. When you were the one who started it. And sometimes we have to realize sometimes when we're persecuted, we brought it on. There's a big difference between being persecuted and being persecuted for righteousness sake. There's a big difference when people say things bad about us that are true. And when things people say bad things about us falsely. But what we see here is that Jesus realizes when the conversion is complete. That's when the persecution comes. Why? Well, in our quote, in our bulletin, this is taken from Great Controversy, page 48. It says, there is another and more important question that should engage the intention of the churches today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How many who live godly will suffer persecution? All. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's in 2 Timothy 3.12. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. And you know, that's taken from great controversy. I've heard other people say that as well. I heard James Dobson years ago, Dr. James Dobson, said that the church is just about 20 years behind the world. For example, a movie comes out, well, it, way back when Gone with the Wind came out. You know, it had that phrase there at the end where, where I think it was Clark Gable says, frankly, my dear, and we know the rest of it. Well, that shocked, that didn't shock the church. That shocked the world back then. That shocked the world. 20 years later, it doesn't even shock the church. So I believe Dr. Dobson was right. The church is just about 20 years behind the world. Movies that shocked the world 20 years ago are now shown in the church now on entertainment night. You see, we're conforming to the world. We're just about 20 years behind. Okay. 
So why is there no persecution? Why is it that persecution slumbers? The only reason is, is that the church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there's so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be kindled. And that, I believe, is why Jesus let us know that when the conversion is complete, then the persecution comes. Why? Because when we're really converted, when we really have a form of godliness and not just a profession, but when we actually have a practical godliness, then we make the rest of the world look bad. And the world doesn't like to look bad. And that's why the persecution comes. Years ago, when I was a Bible worker in uh, another state, I was visiting a, fa visiting a family after church and their daughter was about 12 years old or so and they were telling me that they had her in the Adventist school there at the church, but they had taken her out. The reason why was because she was vegan and the Adventist kids made fun of her. Now, in the public school, nobody made fun of her being vegan. Because in the public school, they didn't take it as a rebuke. They just thought, oh, that's interesting. You're vegan. Cool, whatever. We're all different. That's neat. In the public school, nobody took it as a rebuke as to how they should be living. But in the Adventist school, where we have a health message, and the kids in the Adventist school knew the importance of healthy living, but didn't want to be so healthy, they made fun of her. Whenever we set a higher standard that other people in the church don't want to live up to, we're going to be persecuted. And this is exactly what happened with the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus. Let's take a look in Matthew 26. Beginning with verse 6. Matthew 26, verse 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head and as he, as he sat at the table. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste? This fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now in John chapter 12, it tells us that Judas was one of the main ones who was asking this question. Why this waste? This was very costly. Cost a year's wages. Why is this being wasted? Well, it says in John 12 that Judas didn't say this because he really cared about the poor. He was a treasure and he really wanted that money for himself. If that money that that woman spent on that perfume had been given to Judas, the poor 
never would have seen it. But here Judas is seeing a woman who simply is giving everything she has to Jesus because Jesus is giving everything he has for her. She's moved by love and she's giving everything to Jesus because she loves him. And Judas is there sitting there thinking, well, I'm not going to be giving everything to Jesus. So how does he justify himself? She's a fanatic. I'm normal. She's fanatical. She's going overboard. She's giving too much. She's all full of herself. She's legalistic. No, she wasn't legalistic. She wasn't full of herself. She wasn't fanatical. She just simply was loving Jesus because Jesus first loved her. And was giving all of herself to Jesus because Jesus was giving all of himself for him, for her. And Judas is sitting there watching that thinking, I'm not going to be given everything. So to make himself look good, he had to make her look fanatical. And he had to persecute her by talking about her and everything. Well... Jesus takes exception to that. In verse 10, Matthew 26, verse 10, but when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Verse 13, assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, that this, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Now there's something very important right there. Jesus just said, wherever the gospel is preached, this woman's story needs to be told. That means we're having a revelation seminar. This story needs to be told. We're having evangelistic meetings. This story needs to be told. We're having personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. This story needs to be told. Why does this story need to be told? Because in this story, this woman gives everything to Jesus because Jesus gave everything for her and that is what the gospel is all about. Amen. Well, Judas has just been rebuked publicly. So what does Judas do? Let's keep reading verse 14. Then... One of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Judas didn't like being rebuked. Jesus, Judas was persecuting the woman, forgiving everything, and instead of taking a rebuke and humbling himself, now he's going to persecute Jesus. I'll hand him over. You don't, you don't rebuke me in public. Judas was not converted. He was convinced, but he wasn't converted. And friends, that's why we see a lot of sin in the church is because a lot of us are convinced, but we still need to be converted. We still need to be changed. But what we see here is, again, what the Beatitudes are telling us about. A woman here is ready to give everything to Jesus because Jesus gave everything for her. And other people in that group were not ready to do that. So they persecute her. She's fanatical. She's gone too far. She's wasting money. Instead of realizing God's love has changed this woman's heart. 
It's the same thing with my friend in the other district years ago. She wasn't being a vegan to be self-righteous. She wasn't being a vegan to be better than anybody else. That is just what she thought she needed to do to give all of her body for Jesus because Jesus gave his body for her. It wasn't about anybody else. It wasn't about showing anybody else up. It was about her love relationship with Christ. And other people thought, saw that and they're like, well, we're not going to go that far in our relationship with Christ. So we'll just call you fanatical. And then that way that makes us look normal. You see? God allows persecution to purify the church. When we're doing the right things for the right reason, even though we're being persecuted for it, it shows that we are doing it for the right reason. We're not doing the right things to get a pat on the back because we're doing the right things even when we don't get a pat on the back. We're doing the right things, not so that we get recognition and praise. We're doing the right thing, even though we're being reviled, mocked, and made fun of. That's how we know we're serving God for the right reason. When we do it, even if we're persecuted. And friends, nothing will purify the church like persecution. As a matter of fact, when we were uh, a while back, we were studying the message to the seven churches in Revelation. And we saw the church of Smyrna that was a persecuted church, but was given the hope that if you're faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. And then after that came a church that started compromising. And as we look back in the history of the church, we see that there is something much worse than persecution. There is something much more deadly than persecution. And that's compromise with the world. Amen. Compromise is the enemy, not persecution. Persecution will purify the church. It'll purify our motives for why we do what we do. As a matter of fact... In Revelation 12, verse 17. It says in the dragon, that's Lucifer, that's Satan. Still hear some pages turning, which is great. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And friends, when you go online and you see the things that people are saying about Seventh-day Adventists, And you're like, why, why, why is all this being allowed? Why are they able to say such crazy things? Remember, Satan is not at war with a church that does not keep the commandments. They're cool with him. He's cool with them. Satan is at war with a church that keeps the commandments. And I have studied with people who have told me, you know, our, our parents aren't Christians. And, and when we became Baptist, our parents didn't say anything. Or when we became Methodist or whatever, it, 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 they didn't say anything. But now that we're becoming Seventh-day Adventists, they're throwing a fit. And I've told them, Satan is not at war with the churches who do not keep the commandments. He's at war with a church that raises the standard where it belongs. So we should take comfort from that. 
He went to make war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In closing, I want to share a passage from our Sabbath school lesson this morning. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Again, the, the persecution we endure will not compare to the glory that will be given to us. And then going to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31 of Romans chapter 8. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. When Stephen stood up for Jesus and the stones started flying his way, it says that he looked up into the heavens and said, I see the son of God standing at the right hand of the throne, standing at the right hand of the throne. Friends, when Stephen stood up for Jesus, Jesus wasn't going to take that state sitting down. When Stephen stood up for Jesus, Jesus stood up for Stephen. Who is he who condemns us? It is God who justifies Verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and in furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For your sake, we are killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Friends, when that woman was being persecuted by the disciples, by the way, she wasn't persecuted by the world. She was persecuted by Jesus' disciples. Because she was doing what was right. Just like my little 12 year old friend wasn't being persecuted by the world when she was following her convictions. She was being persecuted by the kids in the church. After all, it wasn't Rome that wanted Jesus crucified. It was his church. Friends, whenever we stand up for what's right we're going to be persecuted. 
But whenever we stand up, Jesus is right there with us. He stood up for Stephen. He stood with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And he will never let us be separated from him when we are standing up for him or with him. He will always be with us. So what did you decide during our study? What have you decided? Stand up for Jesus. Amen. All right. Our closing hymn is hymn number 529.